In this week's video, I'll be showing how I throw my espresso cups, throw the chucks on which they're turned upon, how the pieces are then trimmed, and finally, how the handles are attached and pulled. This is my first time making a large batch of espresso cups since I did my three-year apprenticeship with Lisa Hammond at Mays Hill Pottery. During that period, I must have made thousands of them, but since then, I've only really made a handful in my own design, so I thought that it's probably time to make a much larger batch. This is one of a handful I made and fired, and for some reason I didn't note down the weight of clay used, nor the dimensions the pot was thrown to. So before committing and making lots of these, I had to do some reverse engineering. By weighing the fired cup, I can see that the form was more or less thrown with 100 grams of clay. Then I need to figure out the shrinkage, and in order to be able to do that, I need to know how much my clay body shrinks from freshly thrown to fired. Essentially, all you need to do is roll out a slab of soft clay and then score a 10 cm line in. You can then dry this piece out, bisque fire it and glaze fire it, and then you can measure that 10 cm line once again. And in this instance, what was initially a 100 mm line fired to one which was an 88 mm line, thus shrinking 12%. Once you have that information, it can be quite easy to measure pieces that are already fired and work out their original thrown dimensions. Although it is worth noting that this can change drastically depending on the type of clay body you're using. For instance, porcelain shrinks a lot more than stoneware at a rate of about 14 to 16%, while terracotta can be from 8 to 12%. So once I've measured my fired pot, I take that number and divide it by 100. I then times that by 12 and add it back to the original dimension, which in this case gave me a height of about 7.28 centimeters. I then do the exact same thing for the width, and now I'm pretty much ready to get started, although I will usually round up the height to account for the clay that's removed when I trim the base of the pot. It's also worth noting that I do throw one tester piece before committing to the rest of the batch, and if I'm happy with that, and the weight, and the dimensions, I'll then proceed to wedging up all the other lumps of clay, and begin repetition throwing properly. So, as always, the process begins with preparing the clay. This may look like terracotta, but it is in fact a high iron stoneware clay body. As these will be such small lumps of clay to throw with, I make sure that the clay I use is very soft. The pieces have such little height anyway, and they're also very easy to lift away. So I can get away with using clay that's actually very soft. The consistency of the clay I use does change depending on the shape of pot I'm making. For pieces like plates and low bowls, I can use incredibly soft clay, but if it's a more complex form like a teapot body or a very tall and cylindrical vase, I'll use much firmer clay. At the time of filming this, there was a small heat wave, and in my studio it's about 32 degrees Celsius. So to keep these lumps of clay from drying out, I made sure to give them a good spray with water, and as I was throwing, I also kept them wrapped up in plastic, as otherwise they can quickly develop a sort of harder outer shell, which can just make centering and pulling the walls of clay up all the more troublesome. Once each 100 gram lump has been weighed out, I'll quickly go through them, two at a time, slamming and rolling them against the table, which effectively just amalgamates the weighed out pieces of clay into more individual, homogeneous lumps. Once all the wedging's been done, I'll transfer them onto a sheet of plastic next to my wheel. If I were instead to place them directly on the absorbent wood, those that are at the bottom of the pile and are directly in contact with the wood would again develop a layer that's slightly firmer as the moisture is absorbed out. I give them one last spray, which again is really only something I do when the weather is exceedingly hot. In the colder months, I might not take as many precautions. As for the throwing tools I'm using, they're really simple for these. There's a sponge on a stick, so I can remove the excess water from inside the cups, a potter's needle for popping bubbles and removing uneven rims, then there's the twisted wire of course for slicing through the bases of pots, and finally my ancient trusted kidney for scraping clean the walls and shaping the piece. So let's begin. Fundamentally these are incredibly simple forms. Perhaps one of the harder aspects though is centering such a small lump of clay. It's the palm and ball of my thumb of my left hand that are doing most of the work. As the clay is so soft, it only takes a moment to center, and then I can push my finger and thumb into the middle and form the base. 
Now, as I'm pulling the walls of clay up, notice what my index finger on my left hand is doing. It pushes down on the rim as I pull the walls up. This keeps it under control and prevents any undulations from appearing as I'm throwing. This is something that can let me get away with throwing clay that's not really well wedged. These small shapes only take about two pulls for the clay to be at the correct height. I then do a little bit of shaping, making sure that they taper correctly from bottom to top. And I then pinch the rim so it's a beveled edge that flares outward, which will make it more comfortable to drink from. I then remove any excess slip or water from inside the pot, and then trim the bottom so the wall of the piece flows directly into the wheel head. I then take the sharp edge of a metal kidney and hold it at the angle I want the walls of the pot to be, and with my fingers from the inside, I push the clay out against this edge. This gives the pot a nice shape, and it also removes all the wet slip that coated the outside of the pot, which will make it far easier to lift away once wired through and ready to come off the wheel. I then soften the drinking lip ever so slightly with a chamois leather, and then slide a taut wire underneath it. I then quickly scrape the slip off my hands and carefully lift the piece away, spinning the wheel at the exact moment that I lift it, which helps the pot separate more cleanly from the wheel. And here's the freshly thrown next to the fired piece to give you an example of just how much they shrink during this process. It's also something I check with the first thrown piece, just to make sure proportionally things are looking right. An hour or so later, once the board is totally full up, I can lift the pieces away for them to now slowly dry out to leather hard. As each piece is so light, as soon as their rims begin to turn leather hard, I'll flip them over so that their bases can dry out more evenly. Now that all these pieces have been thrown, I can make the chuck, which these will be trimmed on, which is a process you guys have been asking me to film for such a long time now. A chuck is essentially a solid lump of clay which fits inside the pot so that I can trim them more easily. This is an approximate cross-section of what they do. The espresso cup is placed on top and the rim rests upon the shoulder of the chuck, which is perfectly round and forces that shape onto the espresso cup, if by chance they have distorted a little bit as they dry. The chuck also supports the base of the piece, which means I can trim the thin bases without them bowing in slightly, as the flat top of the chuck underneath supports the base of the espresso cup. I don't measure anything when I throw these. I simply picture in my mind's eye the shape I need to throw that would fit perfectly inside the espresso cup. I also throw my chucks to be completely solid, which I think helps them last longer and prevents them from deforming with use. I cone the lump of clay up and down a number of times so that it's really well centered. This process is sort of like wedging on the wheel. And as I'm coning, I watch the very tip of the lump of clay. If as you're coning, the top undulates a lot, it means that your lump of clay probably needs to be coned a few more times. As ideally, what I'm looking for is a tip that remains perfectly centered as I push it upward. Then once I'm happy that the clay is really centered well, I can begin to shape it. I form it into a rough conical shape, tapering from bottom to top. The important thing to remember really is it doesn't need to be perfect at this stage. You can throw them to be a bit thicker than what you might need, and then once leather hard you can trim the chuck down so that it fits the internal space of whatever pot you're making perfectly, rather than making it too little and not having it fit the pot whatsoever. So at this stage it really is just the rough approximate shape. I then use a rubber kidney just to refine the shape and to remove all that soaking wet slip that envelops the chuck. I flatten the top and then clean up that top edge by removing any excess messy clay and by using a chamois leather. Throwing these I think is the easy part really. I think what's perhaps more of a challenge is visualising the shapes that you need to make. And of course you can measure the internal dimensions of the pots that you want these to be used for to aid your throwing of the chuck. But like anything else I think the more you make them, the more you use them, the easier you'll find it. I then do a little bit of cleanup around the base just to keep things neat and tidy, which I'm sure 
those of you who've been watching me for a while now will know that's more or less how I conduct most of my practice. Also, don't be afraid to offer up and place a cup over the chuck at this stage, as by doing this you'll quickly be able to see whether it's right or wrong, and as the clay is still soft, you can still make any adjustments very easily. But once I'm content with the shape, I take a paint stripper and I blast the piece until the outside surface is more or less just approaching leather hard. Then I can slice a wire underneath and I can lift it away from the wheel head. Although you can just as easily make these on a throwing bat too. That way you don't have to lift them off like this. Now I've made this chuck, I'll leave it with my espresso cups to slowly dry overnight. I want this to be quite firm by morning. It shouldn't deform or be damaged as you handle it, nor should the cups placed onto it do the same. Chucks are such useful tools when you're repetition making, and it means I can trim the walls of the pot and the base without any lumps of clay or mechanical arms like you might find on a Giffen grip getting in the way. And when you're trimming many multiples, anything to speed up the process and cut off 10 seconds here and there can make a huge difference in regard to how efficiently you make. This is now the following day, and the espresso cups are uniformly leather hard, which means I can begin to trim. I brush a little bit of slip onto the base of the chuck, and then spend a few moments rubbing it back and forth until it's perfectly centered on the wheel. The tacky slip secures it in place, but you could also position three lumps of clay around the base to help secure it even more. I can then take a cup, place it over top, tap center it so the base is totally level, and then I place over that a spinner that was made for me by Richard Carter, which lets me apply downward pressure throughout the piece without focusing it all in one spot. I then trim the sides to be flat and smooth, perhaps removing about two millimeters of clay from the outside surface. I then use the flat sharp edge of a metal kidney just to make sure the shape is correct and to soften over any more prominent trimming marks. Then I can trim the beveled edge onto the base. And in this instance, the spinner acts as a nice measure so that I can trim all of the bases of these cups to be the same. I then use a flexible metal kidney to burnish over the trimmed areas. And then I take my porcelain maker's mark, which I carved myself, and press it carefully into the thin base of the pot. And then I can move on to trimming the next piece, which there are many of, as I made lots of these. The other skill that helps speed this process up no end is tap centering, and I have a whole video on that subject, which I'll leave a link to on screen now or in the description too. Opposite of where I'm working is usually a mirror. It's been replaced by my camera at the moment, but usually it's positioned in such a way that I can see a perfect side view of the pot and the chuck. So when I am tap centering, I know that the pot is perfectly level when I look in the mirror, the base doesn't undulate as I spin the wheel, instead it's just perfectly flat. As I'm trimming, I push down with my left hand through the tool, which keeps the cup firmly in place, as there still is a chance that the pot can dislodge and move as you're working. And even when I trim and burnish without that tool there, you'll notice that I'm still applying downward pressure with my middle finger as I work. I then push in my maker's mark rocking it from corner to corner so that it transfers into the soft clay properly. And that's all the trimming done, although I will come back to the wheel to give these one last go over at the very end. I then slide a very thin metal edge underneath the chuck to remove it, and whenever I'm not using it, I'll keep it wrapped up tightly in some plastic sheeting, just so it stays leather hard. The next step for these is making the handles. These are very fiddly things to pull as compared to the handles of my mugs and other coffee cup forms. I start with a block of clay that roughly tapers from top to bottom. I cover the lump in water and then firmly grip it at the top near my left hand and then pull the clay downward. Every couple of pulls I change the orientation of my pulling hand. That way the cross section of the length remains even as if you were to only pull this from one side constantly you'd end up with a shape that's much thicker on one side than the other. But essentially, what I'm making here is a long length of clay, which I'll then cut into individual handle blanks. I make certain that I'm using enough water throughout this entire process, as if my hand 
or the length of clay dries. It causes the two parts to stick to each other, and the most likely scenario is that you'll rip the handle length clean off, destroying it. I then place each one onto a board like so, and I slice them off against the sharp edge of the wearboard. As I'm going to be making handles that are all the same, I try to make sure that the length and width of each handle blank is more or less the same, although ultimately it doesn't matter if they vary a little bit at this stage, as each blank will be attached to a cup and pulled again, and it's the second round of pulling that really matters, as once the handle is attached to the cup, that's when you do all the fine, more detailed work. But first, I need more handle blanks. I think I had to pull about 60 or so for this batch, and I always make about 5 to 10 extra just in case, especially as this type of handle isn't so ingrained in my mind like those of my normal cups are, and I'm sure anyone who's pulled handles will know it's very, very easy to destroy them. So having additional blanks just as backup is useful. When you slice them off like so, it needs to be done on an edge that overhangs slightly from the table or you can even use the tabletop itself. Either way, I'll have to move these off the wooden surface this time round, because not only are they so thin, but as previously mentioned, these were made during a very hot week, and the absorbent birch ply board these are being placed onto will really quickly draw out the moisture in the handle blanks, and ideally I want them to be very soft when I attach them, as it makes blending the handle into the cup itself far more easy. Once all the handles were pulled, I lay out a sheet of plastic and carefully transfer the handle blanks onto it. Once here, I can simply wrap them up in between handles, and I can easily spray them with water too if things are getting too dry. Thankfully, here in the UK, hot weather like this doesn't happen all too often. When pots are drying out too quickly and you're constantly rushing to finish things, it can make the whole process quite stressful. So to begin the handling process itself, I take one of the blanks and I tap out a flared end. This flare will provide me with material which I can easily blend into the body of the espresso cup. I then score the area where I want the handle to go, and then on top of this I dab just a little bit of slip. And before I place the espresso cup back down on the table, I make sure to quickly wipe it clean so that no burrs of clay stick into the freshly finished base. I then push the handle firmly onto the espresso cup, and then blend in that flare of clay all the way around the join, making it as seamless as possible. I don't use any water for this blending process, I just smear the clay with my index finger and thumb. Once firmly attached, then the proper pulling can begin. I cover the handle blank with water and also dunk my hand. I then begin pulling, bit by bit, right from the top of the handle, all the way down the entire length to the bottom, making sure that the pressure I squeeze with at the top stays consistent throughout the entire pull. Once it's long enough, I switch to using the tip of my thumb to really dig it in towards the top and to create three distinct grooves. I then gently grasp the bottom of the handle and bend it into place. I don't score and slip the bottom join as the angle which it joins lets me easily smear the clay both left and right onto the cup in a way that wasn't quite possible with the top join. I then use a wetted finger just to clean over any marks left from this joining process to make the handle look as if it just flows naturally back into the cup. And that's more or less it for one of these. Now to do the same thing 60 more times in a row. And again, due to the hot weather, I keep the tops of these partly covered as I work so that the rims don't turn bone dry too quickly. Once a full board of these is finished, I position the handles of the two sets of cups either end inward, that way the plastic sheeting won't damage them as it might do otherwise if they were to come into contact with each other. And once again, due to the heat wave, I take the extra precaution of really spraying these thoroughly. That way I can wrap them up and they can slowly acclimatise to one another, the handle and the cup, in their own sealed, humid atmosphere. And once fully wrapped up, I'll leave them like that for a couple of days. In this instance, I let them sit like this over the weekend. The goal is to get both the handle and the cup to be the exact same consistency. Only thereafter will I uncover them and dry them out normally. If instead, I were to just leave these out and let them dry in the open air straight away, one part, usually the thinner handle, ends up drying out far quicker. And as the two components dry at different rates, 
it'll cause the handle to simply crack and very easily fall off. And here we are again, approaching the end, the Monday of the following week. I made sure to wrap these very tightly all the way around due to the weather, as all it takes is one sneaky draft to find its way into your drying work to create all kinds of issues. There's only one final thing that needs to be done to these cups, and that's a tiny bit of quality control specifically focused on where the handle joins on the bottom of the cup, as there can be some runover clay from the handling process that finds its way onto the base and the beveled edge that surrounds the bottom, and of course it's in my nature to make sure that everything is as perfectly finished as it can possibly be. So I transfer the espresso cups onto a brand new board, which I then move over to my wheel so that I can go over and double check each piece. And for this process, once again, I need the chuck which I specially made for these cups. And this is where I store them when I'm not using them, all wrapped up in plastic in an airtight box. Some of these have remained leather hard for more than a year now, which is extraordinary really. And with my older ones especially, I'll submerge them entirely in water when I'm finished with them before wrapping them back up. And the reason I prefer leather hard chucks is simply because they tend to stick to the pots that are placed on them a lot better as compared to say bone dry or even bisque fired chucks. And here's the runover which I was talking about on the cups. As you can see, it's really only a very little bit of clay, but considering the general finish of my work, if I were to leave it there, it would feel very out of place and forgotten about, and it only takes a second or two to fix it. Each cup is roughly tap centred, and then I use a very fine trimming tool just to go over that beveled edge. I also use the pads of my fingers at this stage just to soften over any particularly sharp edge on the base of the pot. And about 20 minutes later, after each one has been carefully gone over and double checked, they're finally ready to be allowed to turn bone dry so that they can be biscuit fired up to 1000 degrees Celsius and then glazed and then at long last fired in my gas kiln. Another thing I do after using a chuck, especially a new one, is after using it, I'll just go over and burnish all the edges, sealing the surface and trying to make it as smooth as possible. It's then sliced off, the wheel head cleaned one last time, and then the chuck is wrapped back up in plastic, and this is dry clean as plastic sheeting. I have one fairly large roll of it, and by the looks of it, it'll last long into my life, and it's very useful for being able to control just how fast your pots dry, especially if you aren't in the studio all the time or live relatively far away, so you can't just pop in for five minutes to flip drying pots over or leaving them in such a way that they can remain uncovered overnight. If I lived closer to my studio, I'd do more of that, but at the moment it's about 45 minutes from door to door on the London Underground. So having the means and the methods to really control carefully how your pots dry is crucial to my practice. There's certainly something pleasing about looking at a finished board of pots like this. Anyhow, that's it for this week. Thanks so much to everyone who continually watches my videos and leaves kind comments. It really does mean so much, and I'll see you next week.